Stress is unavoidable. Throughout our daily lives, we encounter a whole range of stressful experiences, from minor hassles to major threats. This tricky topic will focus on how our brain and body respond to stress. But first, what is meant by the term stress? It depends on your perspective. Engineers usually think of this as physical strain on a structure or process, while physiologists often define it as a state that activates the body's fight or flight responses. Most psychologists define stress as an internal state triggered by situations that overwhelm our perceived ability to meet the demands of that situation. Most of the time, we can juggle multiple tasks just fine, but if we perceive that we have more demands than we can cope with, we can get overwhelmed and experience a state of stress. In exploring how we respond to stress, it's first critical that we examine stressors. Simply defined, a stressor is any event that triggers a stress response. Take a minute to think of some stressors you experience day to day. Pause this video and write them down. As you've likely just discovered from making your list, stress can be triggered by a variety of stressors, ranging from physically life-threatening events like your home catching on fire, to more psychologically distressing experiences like public speaking or traffic. Generally, stressors fall under two classes, systemic and processive. Systemic stressors are those that pose a direct physical threat to survival, like danger from a house fire, lack of food, or severe injury. Processive stressors, on the other hand, are psychological since they don't pose a direct threat to survival. Rather, they're associated with threats based on prior experience and include most of the stressors we face in our everyday lives, like these stressors shown here. The idea that there's a connection between stress and health is certainly not new. The ancient Greeks and Romans wrote extensively about the link between emotions and illness, but it wasn't until the 1930s that we really began to learn how. Hans Selye is credited with making the initial biological link between psychological stress and physical illness. He's shown here in sculpture, which sits on the grounds at a Hungarian language university in Slovakia that bears his name. He was a Hungarian, Austrian, Canadian physician and scientist who started his stress research as a young professor at McGill in the 1930s. He noticed that when rats are exposed to unpleasant events over a prolonged period of time, they show a wide set of symptoms, such as stomach ulcers, enlargement of the adrenal glands, and shrinking of immune tissues. What most fascinated him was that it didn't seem to matter what the stressor was. The response was almost identical. For instance, in one experiment, he exposed rats to prolonged cold by placing their cages on top of the building during winter, or he exposed them to prolonged heat by putting these rats in the building's boiler room. Despite the fact these stressors put opposite demands on the rat's bodies, they still showed these symptoms. Selye made two very important contributions to the study of stress. First is that the stress response is universal, in that the same set of symptoms are triggered by all sorts of stressors, like extremes in temperature, injury, or scarce food resources. Also, this response is almost identical in humans, rats, chimpanzees, fish, and other animals. So, our response to stress is universal across various negative experiences and across different species. Selye's second main finding is that it's chronic stress that makes us susceptible to illness. We can handle one or two stressful events relatively easily, but we start to feel the pressure when stress is repeated or prolonged, and over the long term, this is linked to illness. So what happens during stress that can have such a global effect on the body? Selye's research pointed to the adrenal glands and its hormones as the heroes and villains of the stress response. Let's have a look at these adrenal glands. The adrenal glands are located just on top of each kidney. It has two main components. The adrenal cortex is the outside bit and releases a whole bunch of hormones, but the one most interesting to us in the context of stress is cortisol. The inside part of the adrenal gland is called the adrenal medulla, and it releases different types of hormones than the cortex. The main ones are epinephrine and norepinephrine, which are also called adrenaline and noradrenaline. The physiological response to stress has two universal components that involve different parts of the adrenal gland, the HPA axis 
and the adrenal medullary system. The adrenal medullary system on the right is the connection between stress and hormone release from the adrenal medulla. When we're faced with a stressor, this gets signaled to the hypothalamus, which then activates sympathetic nerves. This is the body's fight or flight response, activated during times of threat or emergency. The adrenal medulla responds by releasing the hormones norepinephrine and epinephrine. This acts to increase heart rate, breathing rate, and raises blood pressure. This fast response is thought to be important to allow quick reactions to stressors. On the left is the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal, or HPA axis, which is the connection between stress and hormone release from the adrenal cortex. When we're faced with a stressor, as you just learned, this activates the hypothalamus, which releases a hormone called corticotropin releasing factor, or CRF. This is also sometimes called corticotropin releasing hormone, or CRH. This travels a short distance to the pituitary gland, located just above the roof of the mouth, which releases a hormone called adrenocorticotropic hormone, or ACTH for short, which travels through the bloodstream to the adrenal cortex which in turn releases the hormone cortisol into the general circulation to do a number of things. It frees up energy reserves from storage, so we don't have to pull energy out of the digestive system, which takes a long time. It also inhibits activity of the immune system. This energy liberation from reserves and energy savings by shutting down biologically expensive processes like wound healing prepares the body to deal with the threat of the stressor. This is a slower response, not surprising since there are more steps for the HPA axis than the adrenal medullary system. It appears that prolonged activation of this slower HPA response is associated with susceptibility to illness. So how does this work? Salier proposed the general adaptation syndrome to explain how repeated rather than acute stress makes us sick. This explanation attempts to explain how the same stressor, which initially doesn't cause huge health problems, leads to much larger problems later on. Salier described three main stages, alarm, resistance, and exhaustion. In the alarm stage, the body's resources are mobilized in response to a stressor, so the sympathetic nervous system triggers norepinephrine release and stimulation of the HPA axis triggers cortisol release. Initially in the resistance stage, the individual copes with the prolonged stress and levels of cortisol remain high. Eventually, in the exhaustion stage, according to Selye, the body's resources to deal with the stressor become depleted, which results in a heightened susceptibility to illness. Since this was first proposed, more recent evidence pokes holes in many of the details of this model. However, it remains very influential because Selye made monumental steps in understanding the link between stress and illness. Research shows that the main problem appears to be prolonged cortisol release. High levels of cortisol over prolonged periods of time are associated with all sorts of problems, like increased risk of depression and type 2 diabetes, and suppression of the immune system. But why would our bodies respond to stress in such a way that we'd get sick? It doesn't seem to make much sense. The best explanation comes from prominent neuroscientist and stress researcher Robert Sapolsky. In his book, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, Sapolsky describes why prolonged stress leads to illness by using an analogy that's captured in the title. Sapolsky put it this way, Unlike humans, stress-related illnesses are actually rare in wild animals, despite the fact that our stress responses are very similar. A zebra's HPA axis isn't all that different from ours. What is different, however, are the types of things that stress us out. Probably the biggest stressor for prey species like the zebra is getting killed by a predator, like a lion. If a lion attacks, the zebra has to activate its stress response to give it the resources to escape. Either way, the stress response is very short-lived. It either gets caught and killed or it escapes. The zebra doesn't activate its stress response for very long, so only has a temporary spike in cortisol levels every so often. Humans, on the other hand, stress about things like computers crashing or crappy Wi-Fi connections, things that are aversive but definitely not life-threatening. Why does that matter? Because these types of stressors tend to be chronic and therefore we're activating our stress responses all the time and as a consequence elevating our cortisol levels when it doesn't really help us.
like how it helps the zebra. Sapolsky says that this overuse of our stress response is biologically inappropriate in our modern world, even though it was probably properly activated by our ancestors. So, in a way, a zebra is a lot smarter than a human because it activates its stress response only in situations when it's going to be helpful. According to Sapolsky, what makes us sick is not our inability to deal with stressors, but rather our continued response to prolonged stress in and of itself that's the problem. So the take-home message is that if you're faced with a stressful experience, take a moment to reappraise it and decide if it's really life-threatening. If it isn't, and it probably won't be, try and tell yourself that it's a waste of your resources to activate all of this biology for a situation where it's not going to be helpful.